All right. So let's start the class and uh, do the PowerPoint thing. So now we're getting to the business thing. Uh, so, so great that we do all these little pop up things. Um, so, the assigned reading for this unit was um, the engaging cinema and the introduction to globalization, and also the all men in the film and the movie The Searches. Um, I know this is a ton of reading. Um, get through as much as you can. It's a lot of pages. Um, the Greenwald and Landry business of film actually connects, I mean, repeats a lot of the same stuff that um, Chapter 6 of Engage in Cinema does. So if you're reading Engage in Cinema, and it's talk, that's a chapter about the business of film, and Greenwald and Landry is also about the business of film. Um, the globalization chapter repeats some of the same things that we've already been talking about, but I think it's worth looking. I think you can, I think you can read a lot of it really quickly. Um, I'm going to point out some of the key terms that I want you to focus on. Um, so when you're reading, I mean, one of the reasons why I have these PowerPoint slides that list a lot of vocabulary is so that you can read faster, so that you don't, so that you know what you're supposed to look for um, and can do that. Um, or kind of just to review it. Um, this week and next week are very closely connected in two ways. They're connected because both units talk about the film industry in the United States um, and the world, um, and also both, both focus on the genre of the Western. So this week we're doing a classic John Wayne American Western. Um, but I, I say that the search is the classic John Wayne American Western. It's also considered to be um, a problem Western. And what do I mean by a problem Western is that um, it confused a lot of people when it came out. So it's classic, but it, it was also starting to be a little weird. And the Western genre was just starting to die. Um, and then it got revived. It's kind of like James Bond. He keeps coming back to life. Um, but um, so then next week we're going to do an Italian. Has anybody heard of the spaghetti western genre? Actually, Django and Change is considered the influence by the spaghetti western genre. So the spaghetti western genre is like all. This is how Clint Eastwood got his start. So it's like um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, uh, like Fistful of dollars. And that, but the one we're going to see is Once Upon a Time in the West. Um, so the main reason I think this is interesting from a globalization perspective um, is that, you know, I think most people think of the Western as very American, right? It's about the American West after all, so that's America. Um, why would Italians want to make movies about the American West? So that's, that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, and um, yeah, I just wanted to, Django and Change is an American movie influenced by Italian spaghetti westerns. In fact, all, a lot of Tarantino's films are influenced by um, the way the Italians made westerns. The way the Italians made westerns is really different from the way that Americans made westerns. Um, but I don't think you all would know that <coughs> because most of you probably don't watch westerns from the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. I'm guessing. Anybody here is going to say, no, I do. I love John Wayne. Um, I'll just let you know that I personally have like a problem with John Wayne because I grew up in Orange County, and that's where he lived. And so the airport by my house is called the John Wayne Airport, the tennis club where I play tennis is the John Wayne Tennis Club. There's a big statue of John Wayne, and I don't like him. But um, so that's, but that's just me. Um, but here's the thing that I think is really interesting. When you guys go see Westerns now, um, whether it's um, 
like anything that Clint Eastwood does, anything that Clint Eastwood does, or Charles Bronson, or any of these people, um, that are American westerns made in the, from the 1970s on. They are made in the Italian style. So I think that might interest you when you think about from a global globalization perspective. The Italian way of doing Western is the way that Americans now do Western. Because Americans like that better. The old American way of doing Western is a little, I think, a little cheesy. Um, so, um, so I think that's why it's an interesting, that's one of the reasons why I chose the Western as a case for thinking about globalization and the relationship to America. Um, meanwhile, just like a random thing, um, somebody told me, somebody just sent me an email about this right before today's class. Um, a new book about the searchers that you were watching was just published and reviewed in the New York Times last week. So if you're interested in that review, it's in the New York Times. Okay, um, so that's a lot of reading. What I'm going to try to do in my lecture today is connect all the different things and how they relate to each other. Um, because we've got a lot of different topics. We've got globalization, we've got business, we've got genre, and we've got the Western, right? So the four topics. Um, it's a lot of information, and I'm aware that it's a lot of information. Um, and then the question, what I'm going to try to do in my lecture today is explain how it's all connected, at least how it's all collected, how it's all connected in my head. Um, and hopefully by the end of class it will be connected in your head too. Um, so, questions just to start thinking. All three textbooks raise the question of the dominance of American corporations in the movie business, which might suggest a tend tendency towards sameness, right? If we have like four companies that are making all the movies, um, are we worried that they're all going to just start making the same thing? Um, except that all three textbooks also note the ways that difference and alternatives resist American corporate dominance. So what do we make of that? Um, and this relates back to the question that we asked the very first week of class when I said, is globalization the same thing as Americanization or McDonaldization? Um, and this is a question that um, the book Thompson wrestles with. Remember when the, 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 the book by Thompson about the media um, raised the question is like, is there something called cultural imperialism where the American movie industry just kind of dominates and everybody copies America, or is something else going on? And he actually argues that no, something else is going on. Um, so, the second question how do changes in technology and government affect the movie business? Um, so changes in technology like the internet and television. Um, I think your generation has probably heard that like the movie industry as well as the music industry, right? Especially even the music industry, even more so, is really freaked out by the internet. They think they're gonna lose money. Right? People are not gonna buy. I mean you guys probably don't buy CDs anymore. Right? Um, I still do. Um, <laughs> When people come over to my apartment and they see like a pile of CDs, they're like, what is, what is wrong with you? Did you get an iPod that I don't have? Um, I, still, I still buy DVDs too. Um, but anyway, you know that the music industry and the, and the movie industry is worried about this, especially for pirating. Um, they were just as worried when television was created. So actually, when television was created, the movie industry profits, uh, attendance in movie theaters dropped. The important thing to really realize here, um, and this is like a very important part of the business side of film that I, I think um, maybe Stephen Greenwald will talk about when he comes, is that the movie industry doesn't make most of its profits from movie tickets, from theater tickets. Um, so it's a much more complex operation in terms of distribution, exhibition, um, and the movie industry is constantly having to adjust to new cha changes in technology. Also changes in government policy. Um, and this is where the movie business gets political. I'm guessing a lot of, well, in my experience when I talk to some people who don't actually know what they're talking about, they say, oh, people just watch movies because they like them. So the movie that is the best 
gets makes the most money. Right? If it's good and people like it, then they go see it. Um, anybody here work in a movie theater? Like as a I don't know, just in the selling tickets or selling popcorn. Um, if you work in a movie theater, then you know that movie theaters are obligated to show movies that don't do well. Because the company has a arrangement, a political arrangement with the movie house, which means that large companies can force movie theaters to show movies that the movie theater doesn't really want to show, and which means that the movie theater can't show movies that it wants to show, independent movies, movies that are made, that have an alternative way of looking at things, movies that are made by small businesses. Does that make sense? So you think it's like, oh, they just show the good ones. But you know when you go to movie theaters, you're like, why is this all crap, and why are the theaters empty? And meanwhile, there's this great movie that's being out that they're not showing. Why is that? Well, it's because there's a political arrangement. Um, this political arrangement also exists in foreign countries, so that American companies can actually sell movie theaters in Mexico what to show. Um, somebody actually told me this, that when they, here's a, this, this is going to blow your mind, actually. I promise you this is going to blow your mind. Okay, so, wait, wait, I don't even, maybe you're too young. You've all been into a, a, a DVD rental shop before, yeah. okay? Okay, you're not so young that you haven't been into a place that rents that rent these things. Um, pretty soon I won't be able to tell the story. Um, if nobody goes to, all the rental shops are closing down, right? Um, so you go into a blockbuster video in the United States and they have the foreign movie section, right? If you remove movies from, Latin America, from Europe, from Africa, from China, blah, 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 blah. So what if you're in a blockbuster video in Mexico? Where are the Mexican movies going to be? They're in the foreign section. They're in the foreign section. It's harder to get a Mexican movie in Mexico than it is to get an American movie in Mexico. That's not because of supply and demand curves. So all that stuff you learn in economics about like, oh, they have a, there's a demand for it, so the company supplies it, and you think that the free market works. That's not what's happening. This is a political arrangement where the company is forcing this to happen. Um, now, sometimes in some countries, the government can step in and say, no. Um, so, a company, so countries like France um, and Korea, uh, I mean South Korea, um, and Sweden very actively protect their movie industry. Um, countries like Mexico um, don't. Um, and it totally affects like what gets sold, it affects how the movie's made, it affects how it's distributed. It affects the actors who are in it. What's the line of the country that's going to be part of it? That's very high. That's the job. Now, we have that in the United States, too. We have the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, and it does do something. Um, there was a funny, funny scene where, um, like all the stuff that's on TV, yes. Um, would not exist. Would not exist if it were not for the government. Um, so there was actually a funny conversation in the American Congress where the American Congress actually said, "Why do we need to fund documentary films? Why can't we just let the free market make documentary films?" And another congressman responded, "What are you retarded?" <laughs> the whole reason why we have documentary films that we can show in class. Is because the government sponsors that. If you don't, then most of the documentary films that you're going to get are going to be like funny, are not going to be that serious or um, credible. Um, so if you've ever wondered why Michael Moore, you guys are familiar with Michael Moore, right? Sicko and Only for Columbine. 
And a lot of people are really annoyed by his style. He's very confrontational, he's kind of a jerk, um, he does all these funny things, and people say, you know, I just don't, he's just not as credible because he does all this stupid stuff, right? But he sells movies. If he makes money, that kind of documentary makes money. If you want the, if you want the more serious, credible kind of documentary, well, then you need the government funding. Um, so that's some of the questions on how changes in technology and government affect movies. Um, how do companies attempt to control production, distribution, and exhibition? Um, and oh, I didn't finish the sentence. I'll fix that when I put it online. Um, now I don't even remember what I was going to say. Um, Oh, I think it was supposed to be in how do the various changes in technology and government affect those affect that control? Um, what is the genre film and how does it fit into the business model? Uh, I'll give you one answer. Making a movie is always a risk. But you need investors. Um, the movie may not sell, then you've lost money. Genre films are safer. You make a Western, everybody knows what it is. You put a famous movie star in it, but we'll go. You make an original film that doesn't fit into a category. Um, the audience gets confused, the advertisers get confused, and it's harder to, it's harder to sell. Now, some of them make it, but a lot of them don't. Um, so that's one of the things about genre. Um, they're also easier to make because you already have a structure in place. You don't have to pay the writers as much. Um, so that raises a question, though, how do genre films work symbolically in our culture? Because we're all aware of them. We know the romantic comedy, we know the western, we know the horror film, we know the science fiction film. Um, but because these things have like taken on a life of their own, they just keep making them over and over and over again. Um, Star Wars is now going to have like nine films, Star Trek. Um, the same kind of thing over and over again, they become a part of our culture. Um, and when they become a part of your culture, that makes makes you think, are genre films realistic, modernistic, or postmodernistic? Now, you, you're, some of you will know what these words mean already from other classes. Some of them take some art. Does anybody take art history? Or maybe have you encountered these terms before? Art history, um, or in literature class, um, or maybe even in poli sci, I don't know, um, or philosophy, but um, it raises the question about what we expect. Now, sometimes, now here's a common criticism of movies that I've heard you all make, I've heard lots of people make. You watch a movie and you're like, that movie's not realistic. Seriously? Who cares? Star Wars is not realistic, and that bums you out. Argo just won the Academy Award. The problem with Argo is that it's not realistic. Of course it's not realistic. It's a movie. Right? So I don't want, I want you to think harder about what, when you say realistic, what that means. Um, and that's a real issue when we're talking about the Western. Because the Western is supposed to look realistic, but it's also supposed to look the opposite. It's completely not realistic at all. Um, so then we get into questions of what is modernism and postmodernism, and we'll talk about that later. Um, so then the question is, like I'm asking you, like what what is the Western anyway, um, and why is it so changeable? So those are some of the questions that I want you to answer. That's a lot of questions, um, and but what I want to do is kind of what I'm hoping, what I hope to do by asking all these questions is um, kind of lead you towards a sense of how the issue of business models, like how you understand the movie business um, as a question of finance and markets, um, relates to questions of style and form and, and how a movie is actually made and the artistic part of it. So the relationship between the business and the art is one of the key questions here. Um, 
So your book, um, in globalization, Steger raises the question issue of saying it's indifference, right? How does this relate to the business model? Well, the business model um, requires a little bit of sameness so that audiences know what they're looking at and they aren't confused. Um, but it also creates, it also requires some difference so that you're not bored. Um, now, when you're talking about globalization, sameness theory, this is kind of related to the cultural imperialism that we talked about two weeks ago. If you, if you, if your argument is that the business model basically creates corporate do means corporate domination, middle class white Americanization and what's called McDonaldization, then your argument is that when you think of the dominance of the American movie industry, then your argument is that it's forcing everybody to follow the same style and values um, and that kind of thing. However, I mean, as persuasive as that might be, um, we also have the difference theory. Oh, no, no, actually, let me go back and explain why the sameness theory is persuasive, one of the facts that your textbook mentioned. Currently, in the world today, there are half as many languages spoken as there were 400 years ago. Think about that. Half of the world's languages are dead, are gone. And I'm not talking about ancient Greek and Hebrew and Latin. I'm talking about local languages that people spoke. Gone. Um, what's replacing it? National languages, English, French, Spanish. Um, basically, the, the languages of empire survive. Um, and that, that bothers a lot of people. Um, and it's like, it's interesting to think about this because like some of these languages survive even in the United States. You think the United States is basically English and Spanish. But one of the oldest languages spoken in the United States um, is the Native American languages and most of those are gone. But also, um, has anybody heard of Gullah? Has anybody heard of Gullah in South, in South Carolina? This is basically a hybrid language that's like half African, half English. Uh, and it was still being spoken. I think some people even today still speak it. Um, and it's pretty cool, but that's going to be gone too. Um, so that's the sameness theory. I mean, just, that's just one example of the sameness theory. But the other example of the sameness theory is what I told you before. That when you go into Mexico, Mexican films are in the foreign film section. And what does that mean? That means that basically everybody has to adopt the American model. Now, there's a difference theory, though. The difference theory argues against this. The difference theory says, no, 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 no. Globalization doesn't mean Americanization. Globalization gives worldwide attention to local cultures and increases communication. So, American movies are going to start, are going to be influenced by other cultures too. An example of that is the Western, right? I already told you that American Westerns today are more like the Italian Westerns than they are like the American Westerns. Um, and I think probably you all have seen movies such as maybe Blood Diamond with Leonardo DiCaprio or um, Hotel Rwanda or all sorts of movies that are about. Um, other places. Now, I don't think they do a very good job of representing the cultures there, but um, globalization does allow a lot of access and communication between, access to and communication between local cultures, um, including, for example, this class, where not only are you gaining access to Ethiopia, which you've all heard about, you're also gaining access, and eventually you're going to learn about um, one ethnic group in Ethiopia that you've probably never heard about, which is the Oromo. I guess that most of you have never heard of the Oromo before you came to class, um, but almost all of the students that we're interacting with in Ethiopia are actually Oromo. Um, 
So you're going to be learning about that. And the coffee um, movie, if you if you watch the coffee movie Black Gold, um, which I did not require, but you have done. Most of the people in that movie were also ethnically Roma, and most of the coffee growers were too. Um, so you get that kind of attention to local cultures that you couldn't get before. Um, so that's a different theory. So, um, and we appreciate those differences. Now, most scholars, um, scholars of business, scholars of culture, scholars of economics, scholars of poli sci, um, struggle with these two things. We don't think it's just one or the other. We think it's a mixture of both. Um, and what is hard for me um, when I'm writing um, is how I work through both of these things. And it's actually really hard. Um, so yeah, so I already talked about the Western genre. It seems very American, but then you know, we got the spaghetti western. That seems to be. So I think the, the the Western genre is a really interesting case for thinking about the business of globalization, the business of film production, and also um, the question of genre in general. Um, so we have the studio and the rise of the corporate of corporate cinema. Um, and this is summarized in the business of film and chapter six of engaging cinema. And I'm not going to talk about a lot of it because I'm not a business guy. So um, talking about business is not um, something I'm very good at. Um, but one of the things that both of these chapters talk about is that the corporation corporate control of movies is continually continually challenged by new technology. Um, sound, when they invent the sound, television, videotape, um, digital, digitization, the internet. Um, this constantly forces companies to adjust. It creates new markets. Um, it allows new people to enter in. Um, and the old studio structure, by the way, the old studio structure does not exist anymore. The old studio structure meant that the studio controlled everything. Everything happened in the studio. They made it in the studio. The actors worked for the studio. You know, the old studio system was almost like a college campus. You had a campus and everybody worked for it and they just kept making movies. And so all the actors just kept making the same movies. Um, if you worked for a studio, that meant you worked for that studio, you didn't work for a different studio. The studio tried to open, tried to own everything. Um, not just the production side, but also the distribution and exhibition side. Um, most of the time, this as a business model, this didn't work very well. Also, as a business model, um, the U.S. government does not like it. The U.S. government basically said, um, this is an antitrust law. You can't do this anymore. Um, now, one of the things that your textbook does not mention, and um, I would I, I didn't put it on the PowerPoint slide, but um, in the 1930s and 40s, you had antitrust law. Um, antitrust law basically told companies that they couldn't own everything. And that sounds good. I think most of you are familiar with that. You probably learned that in high school history classes. However, in 1994, um, both the Republican Party and the Democrat Party, this is an example of neoliberalism. When I, I talked about neoliberalism before. Both this, and when I talk about neoliberalism, that's that's something that is not, you guys think of liberal and you think, oh, liberal is Democrat. But neoliberalism is actually an economic policy that is actually more Republican. So both Republicans and Democrats are neoliberal. And that's the, basically one of the main things is the new regulation of the market. Um, so what's the radio station that you guys always knew have? Like Clear Channel or something? So what's the name of the there's the radio station that owns almost every single radio station, which is probably why you don't even listen to the how many of you listen to the radio? Like, <coughs> you listen to like music on the radio? Yeah, not really because I'm not much time. So I used to be in the station. But um 
after in the early 1990s, they passed the law. They decided to deregulate the market, which meant that one company could buy up all the radio and TV in the market. Which is why radio sucks now. It's probably one of the reasons why you don't listen to it. You don't know why you don't listen to it, but that's one of the reasons. New York is a little different. New York is better, but when you move across the country, um, it's like you drive across the country, it's the same 10 songs over and over and over again. It's the same. Right. That's because of the deregulation of the market in the 1990s. So that there's basically one company owns it all, and it's cheaper for them just to play the same songs because they have the same songs, and they don't have to worry about their audience because they own it. Um, so the antitrust laws that were in effect and, and the regulation of media, um, let me see, I mean, this is, here's a little, has actually changed and I don't think, I don't think the textbooks actually address that strongly enough. Uh, just an example of that is like, you guys know M&M's there at the FCC, won't bother me because it's better than M&M's. I don't know if the FCC won't bother me because it feels so empty with the acronym. The radio feels so empty with The FCC won't let me be. There's another controversy. And it feels, it feels so empty without me. Right, so what he's talking about is the radio feels empty when you don't have people like Eminem on it. Um, now, the thing that Eminem is a little dishonest about is that the real issue, he's talking about it like he's persecuted by the FCC, which is the government organization that regulates the radio and the music industry. Um, actually, the music industry could care less. They don't care what you say. That's what, he, that's what he's making it sound like, that they care about what he's saying, as if he's saying something that's controversial or not. Um, the real issue that he, he's kind of addressing is that the FCC is, now that it's deregulated, the radio is not going to play them because they're going to play the same 10 songs, right? And there's going to be no local control. And if there's no local control, that means you and the listener really have almost no input on what they play. Um, so that's the real issue. Um, but there's some other things. There's production code, censorship. Um, that's the rating system comes out of that. Um, there's government support of local filmmakers. That's an important issue. We already talked about that um, with the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, the governments of countries like France and Sweden and, and South Korea are much more actively in support of their filmmakers than the United States and some other countries. Um, Iran, they support their filmmakers a lot. China, they support their filmmakers a lot. Um, I actually, by the way, I totally disagree with, I think I might get to this later. He makes, the business of film makes a statement that because the Chinese movie industry is government controlled and censored, that they don't have a very good film industry, which is false if anybody of you has watched Chinese films. Um, they are awesome and they make a lot. And they sell well and they do well on the market because it's really good. Um, I actually noticed this when I lived in Japan because Japanese films kind of, the anim Japanese animation is good, but their, their um, regular films, um, in the 1960s, when Kurosawa was making films, they were good. But since the 1980s, Japanese movies pretty much are crap. And so I was living in Japan for two years, and I was I would turn on the TV, and I didn't really speak the language for the first year I was there. So I just turn on the TV, and I wouldn't know what I was watching. One day I was like, "Holy crap! What is this? This is awesome!" And I just was like totally into it. And I was like, "This is like no Japanese thing I've ever seen. This is so good." Chinese movie. <laughs> That's what I realized about halfway into it, that they weren't speaking Japanese. Uh, so I actually disagree with him that, um, about that. Because um, I think government support of local filmmakers can work, um, but I also think the free market can work. So you have both, and I, don't, I, I think there's a very different economic model. Um, but you also have, okay, so some of the things that also challenges the corporate domination is pressures from the consumer bases. Um, if you're interested in music, this is what happened to heavy metal in the, in the early 1990s, right? So you had the corporate corporations 
the corporate music industry was promoting stuff like White Snake and Bon Jovi and um, Guns N' Roses is actually good, but most of the stuff they were promoting was like really bad hair metal and really bad pop like Madonna. Actually, Madonna's pretty good, but you know, stuff like that. Um, and the consumers were actually just sick of it. And so they invented something called alternative rock and alternative or indie, indie pop. And there's all these new indie labels. And suddenly the corporate music industry realized that people weren't buying their records anymore. They were buying other stuff. So then what did the corporations do? They bought all the independent record labels and they Which is why alternative rock isn't good anymore. Or which is why alternative rock today sounds exactly the same as alternative rock when I was your age. Seriously. Like I listen to the stuff that you guys listen to and I'm like, that sounds exactly like the stuff I listened to 20, 20 years ago. Get your own music. <laughs> Seriously. Dubstep. Yeah. What? Dubstep. We got it. Okay, fine. Um, is that from the Caribbean? Like everyone's from techno. We're all like a metal fan. Oh, really? Yeah. Sounds like middle scrape together. Oh, okay. Okay, you got your own music. Cool. Um, I've never heard it. I should listen to it. Okay, so um, uh, going back to the second point. Corporate form. Um, I'll be doing on time. Oh shoot, I better hurry up. Corporate form from a top-down structure owning everything now is moved to a network structure of varied financial and cultural agreements, subcontracting, and outsourcing, um, which means the global model that we're talking about when we talk about cultural imperialism is not this simple model where the corporation just controls everything because there's a more fluid structure. Um, and this is when we talk about ancillary markets, and the ancillary markets is one of the keywords at the bottom of the slide here. Um, ancillary markets are basically markets outside the main market. Um, so, and this is a really big deal because Hollywood now realizes that it makes half its profits from ancillary markets. Actually, it makes most of its profits from ancillary markets. What does that mean? Well, that means if you're a Hollywood company, you might think, we should have the Chinese actors in this film. Not Chinese American, I mean from China. China. From China. We might need to have a Mexican actor in this film. Because we're going to be selling our films to those people and they want to see their actors. Their actors um, um, this is your textbook talks about this better. I'm not going to go over it, but you need to know these terms, pre-production. I think some of you probably already know this already. Um, writing, preparation, all this stuff, production, shooting the films, post production, and exhibition. Um, when you're doing the marketing for a film, you have to think about all these different things um, because they're all costs and they all affect the success of your movie. Um, they all affect the risk. Um, the main reason why I'm bringing this up is that because when you're thinking about globalization in the movie industry, um, I think it's easy to see that movies. Um, require a lot of collaboration and preparation and work um, and that makes them very different from other kinds of culture like novels and short stories and poetry where you can just sit down and write it. Um, you need a lot of different things there. Um, now definitely YouTube is challenging a lot of this um, and the new technologies that are make it easier to make movies like digital stuff you guys can make movies yourself on your camera that can be actually pretty good if you know what you're doing um, and don't cost a lot but um, still doesn't cost a lot now that it's digital it's cheaper um, so that allows a lot that changes the, the industry uh, this is again all these terms are in your textbook um, one of the terms that we talk about is cultural capital. And I don't know if any people have heard about this term. When you think of capital, I think most of you think of money. Um, but there's lots of kinds of capital um, that are important. So cultural capital is the values, the status, the ethical norms, the legitimacy of something, social relations, human knowledge, etc. Um, now, Finance capital 
which is banks um, and stock market, can produce cultural capital by paying for and controlling the message of art. You know. But it doesn't just work in that direction. And I want to emphasize that cultural capital is also necessary for finance capital. I think a lot of people think that finance capital is stronger, but um, I want you to think about it this way. In order for finance capital to work, and also, and also for other forms of capital, which would be like another form of capital would be physical capital. When I say physical capital, do you know what I'm saying? Can you guess what I mean? Yes, physical capital? No, that's finance capital is money. Physical capital would be like the factory, the building, the worker, um, the machinery. The seeds, if you're a farmer, um, that's physical capital. But cultural capital matters a lot too. What is cultural capital? Well, this is what en enables human beings to function. No business is going to work if it can't function, if it doesn't communicate, if people don't know how to read. Right? Even a basic factory, and I've worked in a factory before, you have to know how to do basic math and read today. Um, I've actually worked in three factories. And you, need, you need cultural capital function. So it's not just that finance capital controls the message of art, it's also that cultural capital produces the conditions that enable other forms of capital. So there's a relationship between art and business um, that isn't just business kind of saying, oh, well, how can we like try to be clever but not too clever? Um, if they, there is a sense where the people can actually affect, like, how do we understand what's legitimate or good or ethical or the right way to behave? Um, so here's a question that I just want to throw out there. Do you think, um, oh, I need to rewrite that. I rewrote the sentence like five times. Do you think that movies are more artistic and intellectually challenged in privatized markets like the United States or in national or in nationalized markets like uh, Sweden and South Korea and France? Um, do you think movies are more artistic in democracies or in like the United States or France or in dictatorships like Iran or China? Um, the argument of the business of film is that privatized markets are going to are better for the film industry. Um, that dictatorships are bad for artistic film. Um, however, I think the case of China and Iran, because um, Iran actually makes a lot of movies that are really good, um, may throw some questions about that. So that's just an open question for you to think about. Um, and part of the issue here is the standardization of narrative conventions. And I'm going to, I'm going to, when we're talking about cultural capital, um, one of the things that America, the United States, has a lot of cultural capital because of the standardization of narrative conventions. New York City has the most cultural capital. New York City is based on cultural capital. Everybody comes to New York because they think it's a place they need to come to. Right? So they keep coming here. Why? Because everybody in the world knows New York. Um, that's it. So that's what I mean by cultural capital. Because uh, it's in movies constantly. Um, so we talk about the, the relationship of genre to standardization. Um, and this is where we start talking about the formal context relates to the social context. So the social context would be business, the issues that are important people, and the values. But here we have a formal context where we have these genres that are created and repeated over and over and over again and standardized. They have the same, same plots, same stories, over and over and over again, same style. Um, and that creates a certain kind of cultural capital, but then there's also variation and difference. Um, genre films are always, the thing that makes genre films interesting to me 
is that you never watch a genre film alone. You always watch it with an understanding of the genre. So when you go to see a Western or a horror film or a spy thriller, um, you already know what those other movies are like, and so you're thinking about them. Um, and then this, so a genre creates its own world. So you have the world of science fiction. Um, and it's not just that one movie makes this world. It's that all the movies keep making this world and revising the world and adding new ideas to it and changing it. Um, and so that kind of raises the question, is, is the genre film realist, modernist, or postmodernist? It doesn't have a determinant ideology. Um, so I'm going to kind of go over that in more detail in a second. So first question, is the genre film realist, modernist, or postmodernist? This is all, this is engaging cinema chapter five. Realism has two meanings, okay? So realism can mean, if you're studying American literature and you talk about realism from the late 19th, early 20th century, realism basically means novels that focus on the lives of ordinary people, working class, structural, struggle, social complexity, etc. That's realism. Um, it means that you're not talking about kings and queens and chivalrous romance. You're talking about how life is hard. You're talking about going to the bathroom, making money. Um, but realism can also mean something completely different. Now, for American movies, usually realism means that the form of narrative has a chronological time, and the characters have clear personalities, and they make decisions that make sense, and um, it seems real. Now, these are almost opposite messages, by the way. These are almost, these are not like similar understandings of realism. They are completely opposite. The second one, you know, chronological times of clear personality, realism just seems, it seems real, but it isn't. The first one isn't worried about seeming real. The first one is worried about critically examining reality. Well, those are two totally different understandings of realism. Um, so when I think about like the Western genre now, the Western genre can do both these things. The Western genre can say, okay, let's look at the West. Let's look at what real life was like on the West. It was hard, it was gritty, people died. Um, or the Western genre often follows a chronological time and has characters with clear personalities and stuff like that. So in that sense, it seems real. If you want to make a good Western, the director has to do his research and find out like what do people actually wear, what kind of clothing did they wear, you know, what kind of you know, clothing, way of talking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, modernism, if you've ever seen modernist art, right, you know that modernist art. This is like Picasso paintings and, and Matisse and um, Monet paintings. They don't look real, right? They look weird. Modernist Art gets into the fragmentation of the character's psychology, formal experimentation, uh, alienation effect, of course, the audience can question their assumptions. It does ironic juxtaposition. Position. So remember that film that I showed you at the very begin beginning of the semester with the, the eyeball and the moon and it freaks you all out and you're like, oh, that's gross. That's modernism. Modernism, right? So surreal stuff like Dolly Cage is the modernism. Now you may think, well, the Westerns aren't like that. But actually, Westerns are like that. Um, I'm going to show you a scene from The Searchers. This is the very first scene. I think maybe all we have time for. Mm -hmm. 
this is this is the beginning of the movie. Texas, 1868, right after the Civil War. We have a woman. She comes out of her house. Okay, it's all very realistic, right? This is not strange. She's looking out. We have over shoulder shot. We have the establishing shot now. Here's what she's doing. Or point of view shot. Someone's coming. It's John Ray. Yay. Um, this is the introduction of the movie. We're introducing the character. But here's what I want to show you. Look at that. Who has a farm there? I mean, just think about it. Common sense. Nobody's going to have a farm in the desert next to these, these bus. Nobody. You go there now, there's no farm there. There wasn't a farm there back then. There isn't a farm there now. But why do you have that? Because those that Geography is symbolic of the West, right? That's the juxtaposition. Um, I'll show you now the, the final scene. That's the opening scene. Here's the final scene. Now, this is you've had a movie that goes all over the country. Like they, if you, for those of you who've seen it already, you know that it happens all over the country. Now they're back at the house. Nice family scene. I have no idea how they're living there, but it's beautiful. It's America. And look how it ends. It ends the, it ends the same way it begins. I think your textbook actually might be there too. So there's the cowboy, John Wayne's character. Who is a psychopath, kind of? <coughs> this is beautifully shot. Got the deep focus kind of thing going on. Door closed time, right? So obviously symbolic um, and Um, obviously symbolic, and you have, um, when you want to talk about the fragmentation of the character's psychology when you're watching this movie, I think you'll notice that John Wayne's character, this is why The Circus is a problem film, is crazy. He's also the hero, but he's crazy. Um, so I think that the movie is trying to indicate that. Um, now, but what is postmodernism? Okay, postmodernism. It's where you have ironic commentary on genre, play of illusion, citation. You guys are used to this. You guys, you guys see, um, what was that? So there was, what was that cartoon? The Warner Brothers, the Warner Sister, and the WB cartoon. Um, the, the Animania, where they have the little the Warner Brothers and the Warner, Warner Sister. Get it? Ha, ha, ha. And then they're constantly making jokes about the old cartoon. That's plus smart, right? Almost all the music videos that you see today are either modernist or postmodernist. Um, they mix things, they have anachronisms, um, like Django Unchained. You know, for example, Django Unchained has the KKK in it before the Civil War, which you know, historically makes no sense, but it's funny. Um, uh, so you have a playful mixing, and they don't care. Postmodernists, like, let's just put it all together. Now, here's the thing. So I showed you that genre tries to be realistic in some ways, but I've also showed you by showing you the searches that um, genre films are modernist in a lot of ways. 
And when you see the left column to the left, you really can see how it's monitored. Um, but I also kind of want to, if a genre film, okay, here's the thing about post monitoring. If a genre film is, by definition, a film that talks about the genre, does that mean it's always going to be post monitoring? Right? It's always going to be making illusions and citation and innovation, and it's always going to be ironically commenting on itself. Does that make sense? So maybe genres are already postmodern before you even have to think about postmodern. And maybe these three categories don't even make any freaking sense. But we have them, so we have to think about them. Um, I'm not gonna I'm gonna run out of time, so I'm not gonna you guys have all know Jane. Has everybody seen Django Chain? You all know Django Chain. I don't you've all seen I don't need to show you this. Um, anyway. Okay, so um, I brought that up because when we're thinking about the genre of a Western, I want you guys to be thinking about like how they relate. Um, they're not just realistic. Obviously, a genre movie is not just a realistic depiction of historical reality. Um, here's the question of whether a genre has a determinate ideology. The stereotype of the Western, so you might think about this. Maybe your generation doesn't think this, but the stereotype of the Western is that the Western is basically conservative, it's about American individualism, the tough individual outlaw, American values, blah, 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 blah. That's the stereotype. So I think your textbook actually even argues that the Western promotes this kind of value system. That the genre already has in it a certain ideology. However, I disagree. Um, I think that genres are basically allegories, kind of like fables um, of conflicting values. So the West, you're able to think, the West is basically an allegory for thinking about the individual in society, the man's relationship to nature. Um, usually the West is either utopian, which is kind of like a fantasy of an ideal place, you know, family values or you know, American individualism, or it's a dystopian commentary. Dystopian is the opposite of utopian, where you kind of say it's a nightmare. You know, the West is this horrible place that was violent. Um, in this sense, your textbook talks about condensation, where the Western basically creates symbolic meaning and myth, where all the thoughts, where all the kind of ideas of complex, complex social reality um, are kind of condensed onto a single idea. But there's also displacement, and this, what displacement means is that you shift complex social problems onto simple symbolic figures. And this, all movies do this a little bit. But this always involves a repression of social reality, um, and it involves collective issues becoming personal, political issues becoming moral, um, stuff like that. Um, so that's displacement. We'll talk more about displacement later. Um, but I want to talk about how different Westerns can be. And this is, this is really important because this is why I think Europeans, this is why people around the world like Westerns, even though Westerns seem to you to be American. Around the world, they aren't just American. So a movie like Stagecoach, what the West is for in a movie like Stagecoach is that the, how are we doing on time? We still have like 10 minutes? Um, what the West is in Stagecoach is an empty place where working class people can become important, right? In New York or in the East, where you have the cities already set up, you have society already set up, it's pretty much all arranged. If you're a prostitute or a poor person or a working class person, that's what you are. If you're a rich person, you're rich. What is appealing about the West or 
I'm just going to say for communists, this is why communists like the West, Western genre, is because you can have poor people rebel against rich people, and there's a space coach where the prostitute becomes the hero. Right? Does that make sense? So in that sense, and stagecoach is one of the most popular, famous westerns. So you're probably thinking, it's like, wait, that's an American western. Americans don't like communism. It's like Americans like the idea that everyone can become successful. And the West is a fantasy space where that can happen. It was also a real space in history where that can happen. But for the movie industry, it's a fantasy space where that can happen. Um, the Western is also a place where you can figure out race relations. So the searchers that you're going to see, the reason why the searchers is a problem film is because the relations between Native Americans and Anglo-Americans would be tested. Um, searchers is, um, well, a lot of Westerns, you guys know the kind of standard cowboy Indian Western. The Indians are all bad, the cowboys are all good, da 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 da. Um, by the time you, but that's not true of all Westerns. So the stereotype of the Western is that it has the heroic cowboy. That makes it a very conservative movie. But most Westerns don't actually do that. Most Westerns, because there's this commentary on the genre, and the genre is always thinking about itself as a genre, you have most Westerns actually critically examine race relations. So Little Big Man, actually, which is a really good movie, um, it's all of it's a, it's a kind of ridiculous movie too. It's all about a white guy who is raised by Native Americans, and then he keeps going back and forth between white society and the Western frontier and Native American society. This is at the time when the Native Americans were being wiped out, and you can see that the movie Little Big Man really is a critical examination of American culture from the point of view of Native American culture. Um, so the West, my point here is that the Western doesn't go in one direction. Um, and then you get to a movie like Django, Django Unchained, um, which is a pretty ridiculous movie. Um, but what Django Unchained allows um, Quentin Tarantino to do is imagine a black man just going around shooting everybody he wants to. Right? Now we know that in reality, in the, 18, in the 19th century, this never happened. Right? But the Western as a genre allows us to think of race relations in a new way and says, well, what if this happens or is this cool? So you can see that like, because the Western, the Western is basically the same thing as like science fiction. You think of this, I mean, here's what makes the Western really interesting, is that the Western scene has to kind of seem real. You know, the directors do all their research, what do people wear, what did it look like back then? Um, but in a lot of ways, it's like science fiction, where you can just imagine whatever situation you want. Um, why is science fiction? Let me just tell you why science fiction is important. Um, Star Trek, the original Star Trek, was made in the middle of the Cold War, right? America had a horrible relationship with China, had a horrible relationship with Russia when Star Trek came out. Now think about who's on the Starship Enterprise. Yeah. One guy is an American, one guy is a Chinese guy, and one guy is a Russian. Chekhov, Zulu, and Captain Kirk. And then one guy is an alien. Think about what that means. It's a fantasy space that allows Americans to actually think of the world differently. Well, why can't we all get along? Um, Science fiction and Westerns also help you think about sexuality and family relations. Now, sometimes Westerns will um, very, are very actively promoting an idea of the nuclear family, man, woman, child on the West. Now, in reality, this never happened. You can't survive on in the frontier if there's three of you. You need it like a huge community. You will die if it's just you know, a nuclear family. The traditional family structure, which is a really traditional 400 years old, would not survive in the West. You need a larger community to do that. But some movies promote the traditional family structure. But I think you can think of other Western movies and other science fiction movies that very actively explore um, fantasies of sexual, liber sexual liberation. 
So um, the most political recent example is Brokeback Mountain, which basically um, promotes gay, gay agenda, gay politics in the West. Is it how things would have happened there? Is it a realistic scenario? No. But is it a powerful movie? Yeah, it's possible. Awesome. Um, Westerns also engage in political allegory. This is an example that I think is really interesting. High Noon comes out in the middle of the McCarthy trials. High Noon is a movie about a good a sheriff who is being persecuted by gangsters and rich people in the town. And the rest of the town won't come to support him. So High Noon is basically a critical reaction to the McCarthy trials. It's basically, instead of, this is kind of like, um, uh, what's the movie, um, or what's the play like the crucible that you guys all saw, but the state of this trial, which is made at the same time, which is an allegory of basically saying McCarthyism sucks, and we're going to make a movie about it, but we can't make a movie about McCarthyism directly because then we'll be put in jail and kicked out of the United States. So we're going to make a movie, we're going to put it in the West. That's high news. Very political leftist movie. The director actually did have to leave the country. Then John Wayne makes a response, Rio Bravo, because John Wayne's kind of a Nazi, so he makes Rio Bravo. And Rio Bravo is the opposite of High Noon. And he did that on purpose. Um, which basically says, oh no, we have definite bad guys and the whole community's going to come together and, and, and kill the bad guys. Um, so that's Rio Bravo. Um, so my point here is that both of these movies are Westerns. They are in dialogue about the same political event in the United States, and they have opposite political perspectives. Um, another way that if you're interested, if you're a poli sci person, you should also be Deadwood, because Deadwood is basically like, how is a state grant created? One of the things that makes the, the Western genre so appealing is because you're in the middle of nowhere, you're basically reinventing society. Right? So as a political idea, the Western is really fascinating because you're like, okay, so how is society created? We're going to build it from the ground up. Um, you don't have to worry about how it already exists, actually. You can just make it up now. That's what Deadwood is. Um, the Westerns also contest the historical myths of the definition of America. So the outlaw Josie Wales um, actually has, is about a southerner after the Civil War who became becomes friends with Native Americans and offers a completely different narrative of the Civil War than the one you've been told. Um, and the Good and the Bad and the Ugly is also about the Civil War. And just like, if you've ever seen, has anybody seen the Good and the Bad and the Ugly? Yeah. It's like, you're like, that was going on then, right? Yeah. You're like, the Civil War was about that? Um, I had no idea. Um, and I actually think the Good and the Bad and the Ugly is probably the best movie about the Civil War ever made. Much better than Spielberg's Lincoln. Um, much better. But it's a Western, and it's a fantasy movie. It's not a realistic movie. It's a fantasy movie. But um, I think it offers a really interesting perspective. And you can do that because you're in a, a kind of fantasy space. Um, movies also contest the genre because they're always about the genre. So Blazing Saddles is a comedy that makes fun of the, the Western. Um, and it's basically totally ridiculous. Um, but also, you can have a serious movie, and this is Clint Eastwood's movie, Unforgiven, um, which critically examines the Western genre and says, you have this idea of heroes, and they just shoot their guns, and they know what they're doing. But there's this famous scene in Unforgiven where it actually shows what shooting a gun is like for most people. Killing people is hard to do. Usually, you're so nervous, you can't shoot straight. And so this is a movie that actually shows that. Um, so you can have, so here's my point, so I can let you go. Um, on the one hand, some people would say that the Western has a very clear ideological structure and a very clear narrative structure that celebrates American individualism. It, it kind of it's racist because we kill all the Native Americans. Um, it's male chauvinistic because it's all about tough guys. Um, it promotes family values because it has this 
nuclear family on the frontier surviving against all odds, great family. But on the other hand, I think you can see when you look at, and you actually start looking at all these examples, examples that the Western becomes a fantasy space that allows for a very intense conversation about all these things and a lot of different perspectives. Um, and I think that's what the genre of film, that's why I think genre of films are really interesting um, because you're always thinking about a dialogue and a conversation between different points of view. I will let you go. That's it. Well, that's the end.